Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Friday, May 19th, 2023, which was actually my nephew's birthday. <laughs> uh, exciting times coming up this week, uh, which I'll, I'll get into in a moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just want to do a quick uh, reading update before I have to get to all those exciting weekend plans. So as usual uh, with these AM reading videos, I'm going to talk about the next story that I read in Currently, I'm reading this collection uh, of short stories, Oi Caramba, an anthology of Jewish stories from Latin America, edited by Alan Stavins. I read one per am reading video, hopefully till I get to the end of this, and then I'll move on to something else. Anywho, this week I read The Invisible Hour by Esther Seligson. This is a very metaphysical story. It's about time. We start like in a very real, tangible sense about a man who's never named trying to repair a watch and not being able to get service at a repair shop. And then, then it goes more into psychological and metaphysical musings. Uh, and I, I have trouble with these sorts of stories. I wonder if, like, reading them, maybe I'd get caught into some of the language, or reading them aloud, I should say, but I didn't actually do that this time. I'm just kind of wishing for some more straightforward, non-surreal stories. Uh, but certainly some of the language would be uh, intriguing on its own. But, uh, uh, and I love exploring the idea of time in, you know, metaphysical senses, but maybe like more as like a, a side in a longer piece that's still more realist in a way. Or like, you know, how a novel maybe could get away with, uh, I don't know, getting more complex. It feels like this is all the complexity and none of the story for such a short story. That's just me and my biases about short storytelling or where I am right now <laughs> with this story. So there we have it. The first book I finished this week is Dershuni, Contemporary Women's Midrash, uh, edited by Tamar Biala. I read this for maybe Midrash, uh, the readathon, uh, which uh, isn't officially going uh, on this year, but I've... Uh, taken up the mantle anyway, and of course, you know, maybe Midrash, reading a book about Midrash. Uh, the Maybe Midrash Readathon is about reading serious uh, fiction and nonfiction works about religion, and uh, Midrashim in Judaism are sort of biblical exegesis. It's about filling in the blanks in uh, Bible stories or about trying to apply them in new ways so that they can um, speak to more modern day realities. And this is a uh, collection of uh, modern Midrashim, written very much in the style of, uh, you know, the first century rabbis in a lot of ways. The ways that they interrogated the texts and made their arguments with quotes and that sort of thing. But these authors are all modern day women living in Israel. This is, uh, you know, a translation of their work. And so a lot of what they're focusing on is a lot of what the Bible is missing and also the later uh, commentaries, religious commentaries in Judaism are missing a female perspective of what it is like to grow up as a woman, or to live as a woman in uh, this patriarchal society or maybe ways that uh, the Bible can uh, mean other things beyond how patriarchal societies have interpreted them. So, you know, I talked a bit in the last video about reading Midrashim about uh, the matriarchs, uh, and then it goes into other topics, not always only about women, but a lot of it is about uh, women and sexual violence and uh, also just, uh, you know, uh, fair equality or attempts for equality in other ways in society, and then some of it is about more universal things. There's some Midrashim that to try to uh, make sense of the Holocaust in here. So uh, it's an arresting uh, book. You know, I'm trying to read a lot per month and it's probably not something you just read alone quickly on your own. I mean, m most religious texts and study are about um, doing it in Havruta and taking your time with it and certainly having more knowledge. I mean, I, I do have an incomplete knowledge of uh, of the Midrash or of Hebrew, certainly. So uh, there's only so much I can get out of it, but I do feel like, you know, it's just an incredible way to uh, bring into intellectualism and empathy uh, to uh, this, to religion and to the texts and to being a person of the book as Jews think of themselves as people of the book. And so uh, I'll be talking about this book again at the end of uh, maybe Midrash, uh, hopefully end of this month, beginning of next month. I also want to read a fiction work uh, and compare the two, so that should be fun, so stay tuned. 
That technically was the, on the only book I finished uh, this week. I'm in the middle of a couple of others, um, including uh, In the Land of Israel by Amos Oz, which is a much more uh, modern day, not religious at all. Well, actually, <laughs> it kind of is. It's a take on Israel uh, in the uh, 1980s, where Amos Oz, who was a famous Israeli writer, went really to the fringes. It's not so much about Israel. It's about the fringes of Israel. It's about settlements in the West Bank and uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews who are anti-Zionist, but who, you know, live in Jerusalem anyway. Uh, like trying to, he's trying to understand their perspectives. Uh, it's not his perspective, although I, from what I've read of Amos Oz, he has this fascination with, uh, uh, with zealotry, even in some books where he is trying to sort of uh, uh, combat it. He has a fascination with Israel and how it makes everyone into a mini prophet of, you know, this is the only way, my way is the only way sort of thing. So he, it, a lot of it really is him just full scale transcribing interviews with people, but uh, also there are some of his own ruminations too. Uh, and it's pretty arresting so far. I decided to pick it up because uh, I, it came up in my page 112 tag. It's been a book on my shelves for a while and I've been in the middle of reading other Israeli and Palestinian works, so I thought it would be a good time to uh, read this as well. And so far, so good. I'm pr pretty much in early days, but I will report back at the end of next week. The next book I'm sort of in the middle of, at the beginning of the middle of, is perhaps more accurate, is People of the Book by Geraldine Brooks, which I'm listening to on audio. This is a part of uh, my endeavor to read through Geraldine Brooks's uh, backlist of uh, fiction titles. Uh, in one of my recent book hauls, I actually acquired two of her other titles at a used bookstore, and this one I was able to get on audiobook, and uh, admittedly, it's one that excited me a lot, because I was just talking, I didn't even think about it, I guess I was maybe subliminally thinking about you know, I'd refer to Jews as people of the book, and so does that book, which is very much about a Jewish book. It's about the Sarajevo Haggadah. Um, the Sarajevo Haggadah is a real uh, historical text. The Haggadah is um, the book that we uh, use for the Passover Seder. There's been a lot of uh, more uh, modern day uh, ones, like this one's a Harry Potter related <laughs> Haggadah that tells the order of the Seder. But, but the Sarajevo Haggadah was a medieval Haggadah from uh, Spain. It was a, a Sephardi Haggadah. Uh, with a storied history, and uh, currently it's uh, in a museum in Bosnia. And uh, Brooks is doing a, I guess, a, a, a fictional account of the book. Uh, and so she has this character from uh, Australia, who, uh, where she's from, who comes in as a conservator uh, when the book resurfaces in, in, the, in the novel in the 1990s. And she comes to conserve the book and to research uh, the history of the book by doing a lot of like lifting whatever foreign material is on the book. And, you know, instead of getting rid of it, she wants to know where it came from to sort of see where the book has been on its journey. And so in the novel, we actually, I think, go back in time a bit to show the Haggadah on its journey. Like uh, so far, I've jumped back to the Holocaust and uh, seen what how it survived World War II. And we see it through the eyes of a couple characters there. And uh, in the next section, we're, I think, jumping back to the 19th century. Uh, and then the main uh, modern storyline from the 1990s is about this uh, conservator from Australia. And part of what she's trying to do is figure it out, but she also has a personal storyline as well that she got involved with a Bosnian librarian is, and is kind of secretly and controversially trying to help him out as well. And his child who was... Um, he suffered a gunshot wound uh, that put him in a coma uh, due to uh, the Sarajevo uh, civil war at that time. And uh, she's secretly trying to help him. And, you know, we're kind of getting a little bit of her past as well. Uh, and it's one of those things that may maybe uh, Matthew Sharapa was right. Like he did a whole Geraldine Brooks backlist reading project. And I think this was his least favorite book. And he said, maybe only people who are in love with books would love this book. And I'd probably add the bias, maybe people who are, you know, obsessed with Jewish history and religion also would really love this book. I do think it has some flaws so far. I mean, I don't, uh, the, the past storylines especially, I mean, they're compelling in their way, but it's mostly an exposition jump, dump to a large degree. It's a little bit too much of that. And I don't know if there's enough of uh, the modern day. I mean, maybe I'm doing the bad thing. I'm comparing it to The Weight of Ink, where I feel like uh, that book by Rachel Kadish 
everything came so alive in that book. The modern day storyline, which similarly had to do with uh, trying to parse the history of a, of a medieval document, and then the medieval timeline, just all the characters, everything felt so real and so prescient and so there. And I don't quite feel that here, but I'm invested enough. And I think, you know, it's not bad. It's just not quite there. And, and, and then all of the history is actually compelling enough as well. So that's where I am with that one. And the final book I have to share with you is this one also on audio, Secret City by James Kerchick, which is about the hidden gay history of Washington, D.C. So yeah, this is a uh, historical nonfiction book that uh, goes back uh, and, and uh, divvies things up by presidential administration, starting with JFK and ending with Clinton. The idea is with JFK and World War II, sort of the homosexual idea uh, came out of private life uh, and became like an issue of uh, public security and like, you know, a bunch of homophobic people, like, you know, linked it to communism and that sort of stuff. And so suddenly, like, you know, uh, it wasn't just a private shame. There were like witch hunts uh, to, for gay people. And a lot of people, especially working in government jobs, were targeted. And he tracks all of this uh, basically through the administrations until, you know, by the time we get to the Clinton administration and the turn of the century, this is when, you know, the, a lot of uh, that bias has, uh, has been off the books and, you know, um, gayness is no longer seen as a uh, disease and it's now in fact a uh, official sort of minority identity and people are, you know, coming together and uh, asserting their rights and it's starting to come together a little bit in the 90s. So that's when I guess the secret part ends and that's where his book ends. And that's where my uh, <laughs> summary of sorts will end because I read this book for the BookTube Prize. So the BookTube Prize was started by Robert at Barter Hordes a few years ago. The intent is to judge the best in literary fiction and nonfiction published the year before in the U.S. and English. We are for 2023 in our second round of four, where we're whittling down the long list until we get to two winners for fiction and nonfiction in October. I am reading a nonfiction group A for the quarterfinals, and I am going to judge this book against five other books on my ballot, rank them so that we can decide which books will move on to the next round. But until then, I'm keeping mum because judges are not supposed to be influencing each other at all. We're just supposed to be privately coming to our own opinions. So, yeah. I did make a video where I gave my preliminary thoughts about all six of my books on the ballot before I started reading, so I'll link to that down below, as well as more information on the BookTube Prize. And that about covers it for me. I am off. Uh, I have plans here on Saturday. There is a uh, book festival in town, one of my favorite events of the year, the Gaithersburg Book Festival, which actually, for being kind of regional, has some clout to it, I think, as it far as book festivals go, and I always have a bit of fun, even if the weather won't be great. I'm not sure about that. I also think James Kerchick is going to be there talking about uh, Secret City, so I guess I should try to go see him. Uh, and then after that, uh, because of my nephew's birthday, I'm going to go into Baltimore, where my family is, to see him, and we're doing a family photo as well, and uh, all that good stuff, so my weekend's pretty packed. <laughs> hopefully I'll squeeze in some reading around the sides, and hopefully I also intend to make a Gaithersburg uh, Book Fest video, so that should be my next video coming out on this channel, so stay tuned. And yeah, uh, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.